And now to uh, explore the subject uh, in a more detail, I'm uh, pleased to invite uh, on the stage my colleague at the Financial Markets Institute Management Board, Mr. Sharunas Jugda, and his uh, colleagues on the panel. Please, you are welcome to take the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I would like to introduce, uh, first of all, uh, panel members, distinguished panel members. Uh, we have Kalin Anne Jensen, who just made a presentation to us. We have uh, Ilya Laurs uh, from Venture Capital Nextury Ventures. We have uh, Ekaterina Govina, advisory advisor to the board member of uh, Lithuanian Bank. And we have uh, uh, Professor Oliver Hein from Technische Hochschule Mittel Hansen University of Applied Sciences, Faculty of Mathematics, Natural Sciences, and Computer Science. Sorry for my pronunciation in, in German, which is not that smooth. Uh, our uh, panel focus will be. Are there? You're, you're, you're welcome to join the, the panel discussion. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, uh, our the, the topic is really wide and and and, and there's a lot of uh, discussion that we could have uh, on how the uh, technology could develop uh, capital markets uh, but we're here in a small market uh, and our challenge is how to develop that market and uh, of course our major interest is how technology could help us leapfrog in a situation where we are in underdeveloped uh, market situation to become use use the technology to become much more developed that uh, we could go through in the uh, natural uh, process versus technology leapfrog uh, process and the other the other aspect that uh, we would like to touch uh, in this discussion is uh, how uh, regulation could help that or or uh, or uh, make it uh, more complicated that uh, process and uh, and uh, uh, whether this this is an issue or whether this is an a, a, an opportunity that we could use uh, properly regulating uh, where the market is is in some markets could or the, the regulators in some markets could over regulate maybe you could regulate it more smart. So uh, what uh, Karl and Anne, Anne Fiance just touched is that uh, there are very, very many opportunities and uh, myself, I'm, I'm coming from, uh, from uh, venture capital, private equity investment uh, business, so uh, I, I, I see there's a lot of investments uh, and the fintech market is generally one of the key hot markets uh, in, uh, in fintech uh, or a venture capital actually investment uh, area. So maybe, Ilya, you could give us an overview of uh, how you see uh, the, the opportunities in, in fintech uh, related to capital markets, uh, first of all, of course, because this is our, our uh, topic that we want to, to focus on a bit more narrow. Uh, and, and tell your perspective, how you see uh, uh, the perspective as an investor and, uh, and, uh, and how do you see those opportunities that are really promising versus so many, many opportunities that are there. Sure, happy to uh, throw in some intro. So the one topic or one aspect uh, uh, which I found it really interesting uh, discussed in Davos this year is what they call the capital inequality matrix. And that means uh, if you like conditionally divide like everybody into a small investor, large investor on the one side, and the small company, large company on the other side, and you do have a like pretty asymmetrical uh, uh, result where the large investor typically has access to private funds, hedge funds, uh, private wealth management, etc., and and can enjoy all the modern instruments, while the small investor uh, uh, really best is getting 0.5 percent on the bank deposit. Uh, and again, on the record, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, 27 billion euro of private savings currently uh, <laughs> reside at Lithuanian banks on bank accounts, earning uh, basically less than the inflation. Uh, 
while uh, the private investors, the large money, uh, enjoys, uh, again, if I'm not wrong, in 2017, S&P was like 20% gain, uh, uh, tech sector was like 30% gain. So if you owned uh, as a large capital like uh, 1 million at the beginning of 2017, if you invested into tech, uh, you ended up with 1.3 million. Right, so this is not the case for the small investors. So that's on the investor side, and on the uh, on the company side, uh, apparently the public companies, uh, large, big, uh, enjoy ability to print money, right, through 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 Nasdaqs and the likes, and and uh, uh, again multiple times I hear like puzzled questions like how come Tesla or Musk is losing half million an hour, and still looks like a pretty wealthy person. <laughs> So that's specifically for the mechanisms of being able to print money while the small investor, I mean, talk, uh, small company, sorry, uh, I'm talking about the startups, is really struggling to raise like 10, 20,000 euro, right? Like really, uh, it's a big issue here in Lithuania. I think that the small uh, uh, funding just doesn't work. Uh, angels don't exist because uh, there are no mechanisms, etc. So when you, uh, again, look at the matrix, I you know we want it for the better, but we got where we usually get. <laughs> is the large guys are fine and the small guys aren't protected. So one of the philosophical aspects uh, which is definitely behind the technologies like blockchain ICO is saying, hey guys, like, uh, uh, we really flew democratizing the mechanism itself, give exactly the same uh, investment and funding instruments, capital instruments as everybody has. So regardless of you having uh, one euro to invest or one billion euro to invest, basically using exactly the same uh, uh, technology, exactly the same process, and you're buying exactly the same risk for exactly the same reward. So I think that aspect is pretty appealing, pretty important. And again, on the record, uh, as far as I know, uh, Lithuanian companies raised uh, like close to now half billion in ICOs in last year. Again, last year we uh, kind of celebrated internally in the VC community uh, uh, the government uh, announcing uh, 11 million euro co-investment fund, uh, uh, which was supposed to last for four years. So uh, 11 million four years uh, for startups as co-investment and half billion one year basically like going directly to market. So uh, two orders of magnitude, right, if you compare that. So uh, uh, to me, uh, and like apparently it's, it's, it's a complicated issue because on the one hand apparently lack of regulations uh, uh, gives some consumer unprotection. On the other hand, you can't ignore the, th uh, the facts and lack of regulation and modern technology allowed Lithuanian startups basically achieve what they would be highly unlikely to achieve in like 100 years. Like, like literally, if there wasn't a CEO, the winning companies at the current pace wouldn't be able to do it in 100 years. So to me, it's something you can't ignore. And again, uh, I'm all for uh, government uh, uh, trying to support that initiative, and, and, but uh, act together very carefully. So not to, not to, as usually, put roadblocks and say, hey, like we uh, worry for a small guy. Therefore, we uh, only allow the small guy to keep a bank deposit and enjoy like 1.5% of that's it, because we worry about him. So, uh, so I think that's great, and, and uh, again, I'm like looking forward to hearing different comments or, or, or opinions on that. So basically, what, what you are saying, Ilya, is that uh, is that one of the key areas for for the market, like Lithuania, is is uh, uh, raising capital. Uh, uh, alternatives like uh, crowdfunding or ICO is is one of the is the areas where that that uh, our market could uh, could benefit uh, most of it, or, or do you see any other uh, opportunities where where fintech could help capital markets? You know, the modern view, the modern view on the uh, fundraising or crowdfunding goes like wow, well beyond just investor or ROI on the capital invested. Uh, uh, we had a conference last uh, week, and Tim Draper put like really well saying, "Hey, like for processes like ICO, the consumers are given the right to buy a piece of change." by a piece of movement. And just as Kickstarter displayed that uh, uh, more than half of investments go like for beliefs, for purposes to support something which is beyond just financial ROI, mm. I believe that... So basically a, a new type of investor class or... It's not even investor, because uh, uh, you buy a piece of action in a way, right? Uh, on the way, you have an opportunity to earn for that, for early supporting that. But if you look at people supporting, say, the Bitcoin system, like many of them are saying, uh, hey, like, we like the alternative financial system. We don't trust always the governments, right? Because uh, uh, they have proven to raise money to fund wars and deficits, <laughs> which as a citizen, I'm personally having issues with both. <laughs> so, uh, so I say, hey, like, and then if you look at the curve of Bitcoin rise, like, Coincidentally, you know, like where Argentina has a financial crisis, uh, the Bitcoin mm. goes up, 
because mm -hmm. people lose trust in governments, in systems, in bureaucracy, etc., and they want to fund alternative ecosystem, right? So mm -hmm. it's not fair to say that the only intent is to basically like speculate and get it right, although apparently there are different intents. But uh, I think it would be fair to look beyond just the investment purely point of view. So when somebody buying uh, a new token in ICO, uh, partially he's investing some return, but partially he's uh, uh, buying a piece of action, uh, buying the change and voting for his, uh, with his own money for something to happen. So I think it would be fair to have you know, like a pretty complex view and not to forget those uh, aspects and sentiments because it's not only the financial which is driving the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yekaterina, gentlemen, how, how do, we, do you see this, this uh, as a, w one specific aspect that, uh, that uh, fintech basically allows to attract different class or different, uh, different type of investors, uh, what, what uh, Ilya just tried to describe, and how do you see that, uh, Yekaterina, yourself from the regulator's perspective, that then it's, it's a bit something new that you need to, to regulate? Um, yeah, let's start from uh, regulation uh, uh, as it is uh, right now. Uh, so uh, rules uh, uh, were developed uh, without, uh, not without uh, purpose. Yes, uh, rules uh, defined uh, some uh, some norms uh, how we should uh, act, uh, how we should attract capital, uh, how we should invest, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and now uh, we see what we see with uh, ICO industry, initial coin uh, uh, offering industry. Uh, we see uh, parallel world. Uh, which is uh, uh, just uh, uh, acting, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, this uh, regulatory environment. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, what, uh, from regulatory perspective, uh, we cannot uh, uh, afford uh, this uh, unlevel playing field. Yes, uh, we need uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, the same rules uh, for invest investors' protectors, uh, protection, the same rules for uh, money laundering uh, should apply uh, to this uh, new system. As far as uh, by the nature, it is the same thing. Yes, uh, it is attracting uh, capital only in, uh, uh, in the different uh, way. Uh, but the problem with the regulation is uh, that uh, it was developed uh, uh, a long time ago uh, when uh, such things uh, like uh, blockchain uh, didn't exist uh, um, uh, at all. Uh, so uh, this uh, situation, uh, when we are trying uh, to say that uh, uh, security regulation should apply to initial co uh, coin offering, uh, reminds me uh, the situation when we uh, try to put a, a British plug into European socket. And it just, we, we should accept that it just, just doesn't fit. It's just uh, two, two separate uh, uh, pieces of uh, puzzles that uh, does not uh, come together. Uh, so uh, what should uh, regulators then do? Uh, and uh, uh, we are trying, uh, not only Lithuania, but uh, 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 regulators all around the world uh, are trying uh, to develop uh, this uh, sandbox uh, uh, approach, this mi uh, sandbox uh, mindset. Uh, that, uh, okay, uh, there is regulation, uh, there is new thing, uh, uh, and uh, we should uh, uh, allow companies uh, to try this new thing uh, uh, without uh, prohibiting uh, it uh, uh, in, in, in the beginning. Uh, so uh, so for, for us, uh, as regulator, uh, to learn things, uh, to understand the risks, uh, and uh, then act uh, accordingly, uh, either to change regulation or to issue positions, and etc. Uh, so it is uh, an issue uh, for us uh, because we cannot uh, afford to say that, uh, okay, just uh, let, let the market uh, function on itself uh, because we care not but only about investors but, but also about... Uh, uh, but at the same time you, you are saying that uh, you, should, you should probably take this approach of a sandbox, meaning that somebody will bear that cost anyway. So uh, that's, that's pretty controversial. Uh, but as, as far as uh, it is uh, operating in a controlled environment uh, uh, with uh, uh, clearly, uh, um, clearly defined rules, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, regulator standing uh, in the back, uh, so I think that uh, we can afford and we should afford that. Because uh, uh, otherwise we just are blocking innovation. And it doesn't. It, it won't work. Maybe at this point in time, we could uh, could have a bit of an understanding of a landscape, in, specifically in Lithuania, because uh, in, in your presentation and and then in general, the audience probably are very well informed that Lithuania is is ranked somewhere pretty high in terms of activity of fintech uh, in our country. Maybe you could just give us a, a short overview of where what, what it is. Uh, what what do you see as as most active? Uh, uh, 
active areas of uh, fintech uh, as a regulator, just to have a, a better context of uh, what we're talking about uh, in this specific market. Just a little bit uh, of history. Uh, mm. uh, I think uh, two years ago, um, uh, the Bank of Lithuania and the Ministry of Finance uh, decided uh, to develop a fintech uh, sector. So this uh, strategy was adopted by the Bank of Lithuania. So fintech uh, uh, now is uh, one of the uh, five strategic uh, directions uh, for the upcoming four years. Uh, so we have uh, plenty of measures uh, how, to, uh, how to develop the sector and the uh, Minister of Finance uh, also do. Um, I think in Europe we have something unique and we have very well skilled people with a lot of technical degrees and this makes us really unique. What we have as a country, we are not always uh, technology adaptive. So if you compare China to Germany, in China 60-70% of the payments happen by mobile payments with WeChat, and the, the, uh, with, which is a WhatsApp-like uh, app that allows you to pay at a food stall uh, in, an, in a market. In Germany, we still have a very cash-based society where people like their coins and, and, and their paper and, and are a bit hesitant to technology. So we need to become a bit more technology hungry to make this a success. If we take the current situation uh, and we, we look into the, the, the proportion of, of uh, fintech uh, solutions or fintech uh, companies uh, versus the whole financial market, the whole capital markets, that's a fraction of a fraction still. Uh, where do you see the, the, the key, key, key uh, issues, key challenges uh, for this this sector to become something more, uh, more uh, substantial, more, uh, more, more, uh, or just a, 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 a real market to become a real market because so far it's still in, in, it's its infancy. So of course uh, regulation is one of the topics, but what, what are the other elements that that could help accelerate uh, the sector? Uh, wh where do you see the issues? Uh, Two words. Um, uh, it's financial uh, financial uh, uh, education, mm -hmm. because uh, our people are uh, stick uh, uh, to cash. Uh, the same as uh, in Germany, uh, seventy percent of our payments uh, are still done in cash. Uh, and when we have uh, plenty of uh, banks' uh, solutions, uh, um, when we have uh, plenty of uh, e-money or uh, payment institutions, we still go and uh, pay, uh, pay, pay our bills uh, in cash. Uh, the second uh, thing, uh, we still uh, stick to banks. Uh, and uh, we are still afraid of uh, these uh, new things uh, because we don't understand them. And uh, when you don't understand, you just uh, don't, uh, don't uh, uh, use it. Mm. It's just what uh, should be done. We should uh, uh, try to push uh, uh, this financial education, uh, try to push people to uh, be more uh, pro, uh, proactive uh, in taking risks uh, because uh, uh, it, uh, it will bring, uh, bring uh, benefits. But you, you cannot make it uh, very fast. Uh, education yes. takes time. So uh, basically, are you saying that uh, uh, th there cannot be any leapfrog because you basically need time to educate people and to accustom them to, to certain new behavior? Or, or do you still believe that uh, Lithuania could become a fintech uh, market? Uh, you know, we, we should have a, a, a better probably recipe to, to, to really leapfrog, uh, because if it's uh, only due to, to our uh, education and, and the way we used to, 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 to act, uh, then it will take a really long time. I just like uh, want to top a little bit on the fintech uh, education. Uh, I think my personal opinion that uh, paying cash versus credit card is the smallest of the fintech education problems in Lithuania. Uh, my personal opinion, when I talk to say average person, I understand uh, there's a joke in Lithuania saying those who have money to invest invest into uh, uh, real estate, and the smart guys invest into funds that invest into real estate, <laughs> right? And, and like from purely financial management perspective, uh, uh, just a severe fact of like placing your life savings into one class of asset is like a stupid thing itself, <laughs> regardless of how real estate does versus the rest of assets. So inability for people to understand how to do like basic 
financial decisions, like very basic, and then uh, hooking the whole life's earnings and savings uh, onto that, uh, uh, I would say, inability to make uh, even somewhat remotely uh, uh, good decisions that places uh, uh, the whole personal wealth of uh, Lithuanian people at the uh, at risk. And as a result, uh, we are not earning as a nation. You know, like I read the interesting news that in Norway uh, uh, last year, the government fund earned $130 billion just in the investment activity for its citizens. $130 billion divided by the number of Norwegians. And you end up like 20,000 euro per person, free money, just because government uh, uh, allowed uh, and, and assisted in investing in national wealth. Lithuanians do not do so, so we're like hard working to uh, earn little and then basically irresponsibly waste that little. So to me, that's the, uh, that's the purpose. And I do understand that you're out of the reason uh, and the problem is actually a uh, lack of financial education because uh, uh, you cannot allow an uneducated person to expect him to act responsibly with investing. And therefore, we have to put protection against a small guy like going into fund and buying like, something because we don't expect him to know what he's doing. <laughs> and we've had multiple painful experiences in Lithuania where people did not know what they do and that ended up like really uh, badly. But the very, uh, uh, very, very, very uh, round of that problem is because uh, they're simply uneducated. It's not quantum physics. I think it's, it's kind of like fourth grade kind of like math, right? Uh, 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 so it's far more important to me than having a driving license to understand what to do with your like, life savings. But we're not there yet. But, but at the same time, Ilya, if, if uh, fintech industry in Lithuania is developed uh, a certain, certain level or certain degree, uh, that uh, that is so well functioning and so well regulated that could attract external investors. So we should not limit ourselves probably only to the story, local market, you know, like and that's the the name of the game basically in in in, in this opportunity. Yeah, I think it's a separate issue. It's great uh, uh, to be a world's financial center. So we'd love to earn from managing somebody else's money by you know building a great uh, regulatory framework for ICO, etc. But that's a separate issue. How we earn from the rest of the world. The primary issue: how we deal with our own savings which we basically wasting away now. Just to, to answer your question, why is fintech only a fraction of a fraction? Because the answer is the one billion dollar question is not resolved yet. The problem is fintech is only in very small details at the moment active and we have the experience from the dot-com era that Amazon is taking over the world and now we expect a fintech taking over the financial world. The question how to do this is much harder. We only have some experiences and we are exaggerating it in the future and hope it will happen. And in some parts it is already happening. The big question is will there be a digital giant that can present us as some kind of financial institution that looks at finance from a different angle. Take for example automotive. Daimler-Benz, Audi, our famous uh, car manufacturers, um, they had to learn that they didn't know where the cars are. They had to learn from Google. You open up Google Maps and you see where all the cars go. This is information that they just have given away for free uh, for Google and that is very, very expensive now and very valuable to know. And only recently, now with all the nice electronic equipment that we have in our car, uh, we, uh, we, we give them data that they need very heavily and that may be even more important than manufacturing the car itself. Mm. The question is, who will have now the idea of having this perspective on financial services, that they will get an angle that the actual banking industry is not seeing, that we might not see, but who is resolving this and might mm. rise up at the digital giant, uh, that will be the winner. If mm. it will be in Vilnius, you're lucky. Um, uh, but at the moment, it looks like Amazon is giving out credit cards, is opening bank accounts, uh, is collecting data. Uh, Facebook has it. And there are many things hidden in there. Who has the data? That might be one of the, um, one of the owners of this digital giant that might come sooner or later, I'm sure. But what, what you're saying basically is that um, if we want to look for, uh, for those who are very uh, successful in, in fintech in, in the future, that should, be not, that should not be those that, that target specific, specific function or specific uh, process which bites into fat 
uh, fat fee uh, business alone, but that should be somebody, some company that transforms basically the business model. That's, uh, that's exactly what happened uh, with, with our digital giants. They did not optimize some procedure. Yeah, that's what the, what the typical B2B business in fintech now is. You optimize something, uh, you let people go because now an algorithm can read a, a, a balance sheet much quicker and easier than uh, hundreds of people. So, but, but this is not the kind of, of, of uh, when, when, when you uh, talk about revolutionizing the market, that's not a revolution. This is just optimizing a business concept that's already in place. Mm. What you need is a new business concept, mm. a new look, a new angle on it. This is a, um, another dimension of digitization that many people don't see, that because it's so difficult to see in people who are educated, uh, we have the uh, industry 4.0, we call it. That means our industry producing goods like cars and all sorts of machinery need people who are able to adapt sensors on the machine and to and to um, collect data uh, from the production process to make it lean, to make it more efficient and uh, more capital intensive and less work intensive because there are less and less people. So my students that leave my school, they are all employed after, even the bad ones, after a short while. So um, the problem of infrastructure is one of the most severe. You don't have people doing blockchain and these kind of things. What I really truly think is, is a way for a complete new organization form, but we will not come around the problem of uh, control, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, on the infrastructure, I think, uh, yeah, on the infrastructure, I think uh, also the, uh, the blockchain has demonstrated that there is a new and in many ways more reliable way to build technology. So uh, I do admire the beauty of the farming model, right? The mining and the whole thing where you basically separate uh, uh, the infrastructure from the services. So uh, like every joke is just like buy a black box and install it like in his farm, like literally. No contracts, no agreements, etc., and earn money from that and yield to the global infrastructure. I think uh, the approach uh, uh, resembles a lot the uh, weird enough comparison to arm control in the US, but the Constitution gives the right to to be arms for, for, for the Americans, not because they want to shoot each other, but because they think that's the only way to ensure the democracy, so that the government doesn't centralize too much. So when every one single one has a gun, uh, again, presumably the degree of democracy is higher in the society. That's what backs the American Constitution. So I think uh, as opposed to the cloud model where we have like huge data centers owned and controlled by private corporations, the Googles and Facebooks of the world, we see a decentralized infrastructure where like every single joke has a piece and not a single one can decide what's right or what's wrong, uh, can block say or allow a service uh, depending on like what, what, what mood I'm woke up in the morning. So uh, uh, it, it, right, currently it's pretty weak and unreliable because you have to multiply basically amount of transactions uh, across like each individual computer. So it's not yet as powerful as the cloud infrastructure, but it's getting there. So I think uh, uh, at the moment when, uh, again, an average farm or an average computer in average Joe's house uh, is capable of running uh, apps for the rest of the world, all of them, we're not far away there. Uh, I think that will come the moment of uh, both new uh, opportunities because basically it means uh, we'll be able to run Facebooks and Google and searches and anything and everything, including AI-based government on every single one computer. So I think it's a good, awesome opportunity. But uh, it will come with uh, new challenges because you cannot kill a regulator or cut apart uh, a piece of that. So, uh, uh, so I think the only uh, possible way is building a community trust as opposed to regulated uh, government or corporation or whatever trust. Because my personal opinion, that's a dead end. While the uh, open protocols, uh, the community control, the public trust model, etc., I think that's the only scalable way and the only compatible with the future digital technology way. That's my personal view. Just, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, short uh, remark on trust. Uh, uh, you touched upon uh, this, and I think that uh, trust uh, is uh, in the very essence of uh, finance. Uh, why we uh, keep our money in bank? Because uh, probably we trust bank, or we trust the government uh, that says that uh, if everything, uh, if something goes wrong, uh, then, then you will get uh, your money back from government. Uh, why we trust? Uh, why we need a custodian uh, to ensure that uh, some assets in the specific time is uh, there and uh, it belongs to you? Be because we need uh, some, some trust. And uh, this trust, is, uh, trust in finance is uh, created by, uh, uh, by intermediary. 
and uh, what uh, uh, blockchain brings and uh, uh, it is uh, the miracle of uh, blockchain uh, because it allows uh, to uh, eliminate this intermediary and to create uh, trust uh, with uh, uh, between two uh, counterparties uh, without any uh, any um, interaction of uh, of uh, this intermediary so i think that uh, this uh, way of uh, democratizing uh, this way of uh, decentralizing uh, financial system uh, uh, is uh, is um, the way uh, the way to go forward but but at this moment we still don't have any answer of who is taking the loss so uh, i think that that has to be no i, I think totally the opposite we have answered it. everybody's proportionally taking the loss because uh, you know the unproportionality asymmetrical uh, uh, say rights or, or otherwise i think that's in nature and a problem with the fintech uh, you know coming from vc business uh, in venture capital uh, you know you lose 19 out of 20 investments Right? Uh, you're taking the risk and then you lose the money and nobody protects you against the risk, no government or no national security or whatever. But, uh, 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 but spreading the risk among the society and saying, hey, like as a society, we proportionally take the risk but also share the reward. I think that's a beautiful aspect of, uh, say, decentralization as a process. Well, it depends on, on, on which, which specific uh, uh, service or which specific uh, capital capital market elements we, we are talking about because some 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 they, 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 they there's no no such an opportunity that you can uh, offer a sharing risk it should be 100 percent uh, executed and that's it uh, otherwise it should be compensated well, execution uh, is also uh, partially a risk right mm. Kalim, you, you had some some aspects for me um, also the word trust is the most important one and even though i like the romantic idea of an un regulated world with bitcoins etc i don't think it's realistic um and maybe a, a short history lesson and and i think many of you that studied economics or finance remember that uh, in the 19th century banks were printing money and a lot of banks went belly up and went bankrupt and what did we say we need central banks in order to protect our money that we give to banks and we need regulators in order to protect us because we don't want to ha have our pension disappeared or all the hard working deposits that we put in into those banks so we created a very strong and stable system and at the end we had the european stability mechanism so we look at stability and secure systems uh, so for me banks will play an important role and have to play an important long uh, role in the long term as well as the current currencies. The euro is an extremely strong currency, very well protected, managed by 19 central banks and then the European Central Bank, and we will and have to keep the euro at all times. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm skeptical about digital currencies. I think what they will allow us is to optimize our current processes. So for me, what is strange, if I have my bank account in Luxembourg and transfer money to my own bank account in the Netherlands, that's the, my second bank account, that would take me 24 hours up to 44, uh, 48 hours. With a cryptocurrency, this happens with milliseconds. So what this financial innovation allows us is to strengthen and improve and make our current systems more modern but I would not trade the euro for any other cryptocurrency. Any other remarks? I think we are in a very big topic, so uh, we will not be ready to go through everything, but uh, we are ready to come uh, with, the, with the floor questions. If you are interested in anything, please go ahead, Virgis. wants to take that? Maybe, yeah, Katerina. <laughs> yeah, we, we had that discussion already over the coffee. 
Yes, so in plain English, this is a new financial instrument. This is not investing, this is not buying, call it conditional buying. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I like the, uh, the way uh, Tim Draper put it uh, in, in, in last uh, uh, week uh, conference here in Lithuania. He said, you know, when uh, uh, a typical buyer, not investor, specifically, I'm avoiding the word investor, a buyer is buying a ICO token, he's buying a piece of movement, right? So uh, many people buying uh, Bitcoin tokens because they want to support alternative financial system. Some of them are buying for speculation purposes, sure. Some of them are not. So the buyer who buys the Bitcoin with the purpose of supporting alternative financial system uh, is a conditional buyer, right? So uh, he enjoys a piece of uh, wealth if the uh, coin takes off, if the company takes off, etc. But the company is not liable to these uh, purchases in most cases if something goes wrong. Well, again, call it conditional buying. <laughs> Very simple. So you see, that there's a lot of uh, issues to be solved. <laughs> okay, any other questions, please? Well, in that case, I thank the distinguished panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.